Do you spend a night in a former prison, plan a trip around a, a town contaminated with radiation, or book a holiday to a war zone? Well, it things? turns out that some actually would. A new study has found that there is a 300% increase in people seeking out these dark destinations to visit. We're joined now by criminologist Professor David Wilson and war zone tourist Andrew Drury to explain the increase in dark tourism and the reasons that people choose to go to these places. Welcome, welcome. So I guess we should start off first of all, David, Dark tourism, I've not heard this before, what is it? OK, so dark tourism is a term that was coined by two Glaswegian academics called Malcolm Foley and the wonderfully named John Lennon, imagine. <laughs> uh, who oh. were for, oh, see what I did there? Yeah, it's good. Um, right. What they were originally interested in was why people would go to visit the site that President Kennedy took in Dallas prior to being uh -huh. assassinated. And since that time, dark tourism is a, a real gross subject area for criminologists. There's a brand new book out on 50 dark tourist destinations. And basically, dark tourism is just people who want to go to sites of trauma, tragedy, suffering and, uh, and disaster, whether those disasters are man-made um, or whether those disasters are what we used to call acts of God. So mm. Pompeii would be an act of God. Vesuvius erupts. Pompeii is something that you can now go and visit. Mm. Man-made Auschwitz and Frank's home and so forth. Yeah. So that's the, that's the idea behind dark so You mentioned Pompeii. It's so varied because that's a school trip. Yeah. Right? My kids went there on a school yeah. trip. Um, you don't have to go far from home, though, do you? There's a lot of it on our island here, isn't there? And what's really interesting, Craig, is the number of buildings that are being converted into dark tourist destinations. My, my personal favourite was something you were mentioning in the VT there, you know, Oxford Jail, which I started as a prison governor. Oxford Jail in the heart of Oxford was a Victorian jail. It's been bought by the Malmaison, which of course Very means posh. sick yep. house, Malmaison, oh, well, of and, of, uh, and is now a really posh a hotel. Two of the cells got knocked into one, so now you've got some really, um, really interesting rooms that you could spend time in. I personally always find it amusing that the segregation and punishment unit is now where you go for a cocktail. In <laughs> Nottingham, I mean, bad, you've got the Galleries of Justice, which was uh, a Victorian jail, a Georgian uh, prison, and people, actors, will play our roles within yeah. Nottingham so there to is, take kids through. There's a scale here, isn't there? I mean, you've got things like that where you can go and experience a night in what was a form of prison. And then we saw, you know, with the tragic uh, events that happened on the Titan, submersible, you know, with the tourists going to do something like that, and sadly, they lost their lives. It can get even darker than that, though. And I know in 2017, there was this coachload of Chinese tourists that turned up at Grenfell to take photos, and that... I think anyone seeing that would go, why would you do something like that? Absolutely. It's always for me about respect and, and sometimes time does help create a sense in which the experience can be educational and informative. You know, it's a school trip, Pompeii. Pompeii. Yeah. Pompeii. Auschwitz is also for some schools a place that, uh, again, trips would be taken. But being in Grenfell um, in 2017, which is still a site of trauma, is taking things too far. There's a trend in New York, believe it or not, where some people will pay money to be kidnapped for the weekend. Wow. You know, this is, the, this is the, the development of dark tourism that one is seeing now. And it is usually about wealthy people who've got the money to yeah. experience these kinds of things. Kilmaine Jail in Dublin, one of the biggest tourist sites around, and we know what happened there. Um, Andrew, welcome. Hi. Good to have you with us. Thank you. So, you are a dark tourist. You certainly started yep. as one. What, what drew you to it? Um, by mistake, really. I went to... I was supposed to be going to Afghanistan, but the earthquakes, going back oh, 25 years ago, um, and so I went to Uganda, and I didn't really want to go there. So it was kind of an animal holiday, grillers in the mist, that sort of thing. And I had an opportunity at a point by a guide saying you can go into the Congo Republic illegally over a mountain. And we, we, I didn't really want to do it, but it was something better than um, watch animals all day. So I did. Going into there, went for a banana plantation and a guy was very protective to his bananas and chased us out. It was in the Congo. It was fantastic. It was like opening a Christmas present to go somewhere different that you weren't supposed to go. And he chased us. Um, and we ran. He gave up the chase and I said to our guy, what would he have done? He said, he would have killed you um, if he'd caught you. And I think from that point onwards, at that point in my life, I kind of found that quite um, thrilling and exciting. Wow. So then we moved on 
um, to different holidays over the years. And so, I mean, you prefer the term adventure tourist yes. rather than um, dark yeah. tourist. Um, but this has become a bit of a career, this sort of yeah. passion for this kind of style of travel. I mean, you you went um, to northern Syria. I mean, it's not a place where people sort yeah. of want to go, but you went there and you ended up interviewing Shamima Mabega, who's the British yeah. schoolgirl who fled the country to become a jihadi bride. So this has become more of a career. Even active war zones you've yeah. been to, um, you're not the only one. There seems to be lots of companies advertising trips to the UK where tourists can go over yeah. there. Why, why war zones? What's the appeal there? I think it's the innocence of the people because by the time I got to war zones, my travels, I did um, um, probably Chernobyl and places like that, the war zone stuff, because by the time I became a bit of a more of a people tourist, I mean, people mention the war, but I find the honesty of the people on the front line and, and I like sharing stories with the guys there. I mean, I can tell you a story which changed my life. I mean, we got to this front line just outside Kirkuk, and it was a guy in a sniper pit, and he had his sniper um, rifle pointed at a house, and he was looking through the site, and he, he relayed his story that he had been there two years, and the house he was looking at was his family home, and ISIS were in his home with his wife and children. So he told me of the two years' torture that he mm. faced that, and I have the opportunity now to bring that story back. So that was my reason of doing it. To tell it's story. interesting, yeah, to tell isn't it, David? It, you know, some people might question doing it, but if you're going there and you're learning from it and bringing back your learnings and maybe yeah. changing a little bit of the world or educating other people, um, it, it works that way. There's, there's a reason for it. I, I, I don't think there's any ethical justification for any form of war tourism mm. whatsoever. And war tourism actually has a very long history. You know, the wealthy elite of Washington, D.C., uh, travelled the 15 miles to go into Virginia and brought their tables and chairs to watch the Confederate Army fighting the Union Army at the beginning of the American Civil War. Um, Thomas Cook used to organise war yeah. tours of, uh, of South Africa during the Boer campaign. For me, this is about wealthy people who are able and I, I've got the greatest respect for, for Andrew, and I've started to read his book. Um, you know, this is about exploiting people's suffering, whether it's for telling their story or for other more educative purposes, then there are ways of doing that, aren't there? I mean, that's why we have war correspondents. That's why we have people going into war zones bravely every single day who know the story inside out to tell people what's actually happening in relation to why that war exists and how it might develop. So surely then the argument here is that it's exploiting human suffering, um, it's disrespecting the victims in the event of whatever event has taken place. So is it intention then? It's the intentions behind the person travelling? Yes, I think it is about intention and I think it's for whether, this uh, whether what's being done is to inform and to educate. And it, it, it sometimes can be about telling people's stories because we need to hear those stories of people who are suffering. But it's why you are doing it and on what basis are you doing it and how have you been trained to do okay. this? is, I think, fair for me. And, I mean, there are lots of people, Andrew, who haven't been trained as journalists. I mean, I, I think of Jake Hanrahan's work on a Popular Front. He's not an Oxbridge journalist. There are ways of doing this that seems to me to be well, perfectly that's legitimate. The, that's the assumption that we haven't been trained, because that's an assumption, because I have. How have you been trained? Um, I went on to the course, um, for the high-risk course, which was down in Andover, um, hostage, hostile um, course. I've been to two now. So I had my preparations, my preparations before I go, and before I left, I would research that area I'm going to inside Kirkuk, any hostage taken. As I say, you can't, I don't think anybody can be pigeonholed into, mm -hmm. a, you know, war tourism or, or saying it. I've been to, what, two front lines, not, look, not searching for them, once you say interviews, taking these pictures. And you say about correspondence going there, a correspondence will bring the, probably the theatre of war out, but not the individual stories. Oh, we, I mean, for me, that's yeah. my personal thing. I don't think you can say everybody's the same. And much of the Shamima situation, I don't think... I think my informed view of Shamima wouldn't have happened if I hadn't taken the path I had. And you don't believe her at all now, do you? So I start... what you were originally promoting about yeah. Shamima Begum, you've changed your view on her. Yeah, that's simply by getting... So that's what I'm saying, talking to people. I think I'm probably the only person that's met her and been with her that knows her. Mm. I mean, she was texting me um, up to a few months ago from yeah. the prison, so I actually know yeah. who she is. I, I wouldn't think... have that if it wasn't for this. I, I think what we're learning here is the definition of journalism has changed as the world has changed, yeah, social, social media, media has changed, social media, so yeah. everyone feels they, they can tell a story. But, now. And there's a lot of good in that, but, and there's a lot of bad. We were also... 
Just earlier in the programme, we were promoting how children should protect, young people should protect themselves mm. from being abroad and having their drinks spiked. Mm. There, there are certain ethical limits that we should also protect people from thinking they can just rock up at yeah. a, in a war zone. I well, agree. it is. Um, we're actually going to have to pause it there for now. But I mean, it's you know, it's a conversation I think we'll probably continue to have. It's a great conversation. It is, yeah, yeah, it's a fascinating yeah. one. Thank, thank you. you. Lovely thank to have you here. Thank you as thank you. always.